Hello everyone and welcome to the Smart Mobility Innovations webinar. My name is Paula Hyman from the Ohio LTAP Center and I will be your technical support for today's webinar. Before we begin, just a couple of housekeeping items. If you have questions throughout the presentation, I ask that you please put them in the questions box. You can go ahead and type a hello, hi there so you um, know how it works. Our presenters will address your questions at the end of today's presentation. Pending successful recording of this webinar, I will send a follow-up email with the recording and links to the, to the presentation materials. I wanna thank you in advance for your participation, and I'm gonna pass things off to Mr. Josh Ford, President for Central Ohio APWA. Josh. Hello everyone, and thanks for joining our regularly scheduled broadcast where LTAP and the Central Ohio APWA have teamed up to bring you a presentation on smart mobility innovations a look into the future of Central Ohio mobility alternatives. Joining us today are industry experts Mark Dillsaver, Theo Walsh-Ewing, and Rich Granger. Up to bat first is Mark Dillsaver. Mark is the City of Marysville Mobility and Construction Manager, where he has oversight of the traffic control system and construction activities within the city. Mark is also the lead for Connected Marysville, which encompasses the city's smart mobility initiatives. Mark is a member of MORPC's Sustainable 2050 Committee, and serves on the policy committee for the North Central Ohio Solid Waste District. He's currently leading two onboard unit development projects within the city, the Connected Marysville Project, which includes the deployment of 400 OBUs in volunteer private citizen vehicles, and a separate project that will deploy over 200 OBUs in municipal fleet vehicles of various agencies. Both projects are part of the 33 Smart Mobility Corridor project that is being funded through the Advanced Transportation and Congestion Management Technologies Deployment uh, Federal Grant Program. Um, on deck is Thea Walsh-Ewing. Thea leads the transportation planning efforts for the Mid-Ohio Regional Planning Commission in Columbus, Ohio. She is a seasoned public servant focused on transportation, economic development, and community planning. She has worked at country, regional, and state levels of government. Thea is a has a BA in Public Administration and Urban Regional Planning from the Miami University and a Master of Public Administration from Wright State University. Thea was elected by Columbus Business First as one of the 40 under 40 honorees for being a mover and a shaker in the Central Ohio community, most notably in her role in the Go Ohio Commute System, Smart Columbus, the Hyperloop Midwest Connected Proposal, and a Downtown Employee Bus C-Pass program. She is the American Institute uh, she is in the American Institute of Certified Planners in the Ohio Association of Commodores and is the current president for Clean Fuels Ohio. Rounding us off is Rich Granger. Rich is the managing director of workforce and economic development at Drive Ohio, the state center for smart mobility focused on automated, connected, and electric vehicles and infrastructure on the ground and in the air. In this role, Rich manages workforce development programs from pre-K to PhD to prepare Ohio's workforce for smart mobility jobs of the future. He also manages economic development activities to accelerate statewide investments in the fast-growing sectors of automated vehicles and advanced air mobility. My name is Josh Ford, and I'm the president for the Central Ohio APWA branch, and we'll be monitor, uh, moderating today's webinar. Please enter any questions into the question box for our post-presentation Q&A. And now, without further ado, I will turn things over to Mark. Thanks, Josh. I, I really appreciate it. And just thank you to the Central Ohio APWA for hosting this event. And it's nice to see such a good turnout for uh, a pretty important topic uh, in, our, in our world and sector today. Uh, so, um, I, I lead our Connected Marysville, uh, our smart mobility initiatives here for the city, and just wanted to take an opportunity to share uh, what we have here in Marysville and, and uh, a couple of the projects that we are um, moving towards and, and uh, have going on right now. So Connected Marysville, is, um, we, we are a component of the 33 Smart Mobility Corridor and the Beta District. and, and I'll get into exactly what those are in, in a second. Uh, we, you know, we have we have uh, 29 of our, our 29 traffic signals are outfitted with RSUs, and that is our entire city 
so every every traffic signal in the city of Marysville uh, is outfitted with an RSU and, and making us the first fully connected city in the United States. Um, part of that um, system, you know, we have to have the, a fiber network. Uh, so we do have a redundant fiber network throughout the city. We, we also have five connected pedestrian crossings. Three of those are active tracking with uh, thermal cameras and, and two of them are, are static and they're pu push button activated to provide um, notifications back to the system uh, to produce the alert to a, a vehicle. Uh, we, we are home to Honda's smart intersection and I have an image of, of some of the equipment there on this slide showing you the uh, camera, some of Honda's e equipment at this intersection. It's got the camera and one of those RSUs is Honda's, one of them's uh, the city's, and, and the cameras track vehicles and pedestrians and provide um, information uh, back to the system and, and back to the vehicle and the driver um, in, for, for items such as you know pedestrians that are outside the crosswalk that you may not see around the corner, uh, and, as well as emergency vehicles approaching. Um, just are a couple of those applications that Honda has developed there. Um, as Josh mentioned, you know, we are undergoing two, we are in the progress of two uh, OBU deployments. 400 of those will go into private citizen vehicles and, and 200 will go into the municipal fleet vehicles. Um, so so uh, one of the questions we get asked a lot is, is why Marysville, where did, how did, how, what makes this a, a good place to deploy this technology and test it? the technology that's being developed. And so, as I mentioned, we're part of the 33 Smart Mobility Corridor. We partnered up with ODOT, TRC, uh, Ohio State University, Union County, and the cities of Marysville and Dublin all partnered together to apply for the ATC MTD grant. We received that grant of about $6 million. And that, along with ODOT's investment of $16 million uh, throughout the corridor and in the cities and some local contributions, all um, provided this, this area with to create the 35 mile corridor uh, along 33 and within our cities. Uh, the Beta District is a partnership between the cities of Marysville and Dublin and in Union County and to deploy smart infrastructure to provide an environment where developers and, and manufacturers can test their technologies and products in real world scenarios. So the lab is a is a great thing and it's very important. It's also very important with this specific technology to, to put it out in the street to, to see it uh, at work with uh, maybe some scenarios that can be uh, replicated inside the lab. And, and you know, within the Beta District, we, we have a very unique collaborative uh, spirit that amongst our, our government and to agencies, um, as well as, you know, it, it combines the private sector and, and academia to focus on the future of transportation. Um, you know, another benefit of Marysville is we are a small town. We're just over 25,000 people. Uh, so we have lower traffic volumes that it, that's a good thing. Um, you know, if you, we were to deploy six or 800 connected vehicles in a, in a much larger city, it'd be really difficult to find them, you, you know, to, to make sure that they get through uh, or, or to see them in a, in a, connected intersection. And so with lower traffic volumes those, and, and our city being fully connected, we can see those those vehicles much, much more easily and, and, and which can create a project then can be easily scaled to fit any community. And we are home to Honda's largest manufacturing and research facilities in, in up in East Liberty. It's about 15 minutes to the northwest of Marysville, right along 33. So they've got their manufacturing facility, and then we've also got the TRC right up there. The projects that I've mentioned with the OBU deployments, the Connected Marysville project specifically is the um, deployment of 400 units in private citizen vehicles. So we need to get 400 citizens to, to install these in their vehicles, we're, we're estimating that we need to recruit about 1,600 people. And that's just because some people will drop off uh, once, they, once they get through the initial screening process and they see some of the commitments that are needed, as well as you know some vehicles um, may not qualify for the study. And, and it is a research project, so we have to 
we do have to be somewhat selective on, on the vehicles in, that are chosen. Once those OBUs are installed and deployed, it'll be 18 to 24 month test period where we'll be able to, to capture data from those vehicles and from the infrastructure and to, to ensure that if, a, if an alert was produced, that it was produced at the right time and it was um, moved through the system in the right order. Um, and we're also, to, to get those 400 people, we, we have to incentivize them. Uh, and so we are gonna provide some, some local uh, Chamber of Commerce gift cards that will be uh, redeemable at various locations around Marysville. And, and since it is a research project, we are using human test subjects, if you will, even though we're really using their cars, but we are using the, the, the drivers uh, to, to gauge their interaction with the, the technology. So we do have to have an uh, institutional review board uh, involved in, in that as being led by the Ohio University. Our municipal fleet deployment will we'll deploy 200 OBUs in various light duty and heavy duty vehicles by the various agencies. Uh, City of Marysville, the Marysville School District uh, is, is going to have some school buses in there. And then the other agencies with Union County, City of Dublin, and, and Marysville will have emergency response vehicles, police and fire. Uh, the City of Dublin, Union County will have police uh, and, and sheriffs off cruisers uh, involved in that, as well as just public works vehicles. So we have a good variety of, of vehicles to, to gather some data from. And we're not using the same OBU in those projects. Uh, for all the vehicles, we have a couple of different manufacturers that, that we're using, and, and that's just along the lines to make sure that we can uh, show interoperability between different device manufacturers um, throughout the system. Some of the applications that, that we're testing um, are, are the red light violation warning, the pedestrian crossing warning, you know, uh, curb speed warning, spot weather, and, and um, the lane closure reduce speed work zone applications. Uh, the images on the right, uh, the top and the bottom image were actually captured last week when we hosted the Omni-Air field testing, uh, application field testing here in Marysville. Uh, the, the top image there is obviously the red light warning. If, uh, if your OBU um, shows that you're gonna be in the intersection during a red light, the RSU will broadcast the signal phase and timing. The OBU will provide that alert to the driver uh, that, that you'll be in the intersection at, during a red light phase of your, in, your leg of the intersection. So it's a, it's a pretty significant application. And the bottom image is a spot weather application. Uh, you can see the circle there uh, is the broadcast range of a high wind warning. And, and that little yellow sign there in the top corner of that image says gusty winds. And so that, that just uh, uh, provided the alert to the driver that they were entering a, a high wind area. And, and the application that I'm really excited about because I do come from a construction background is the lane closure and reduced speed work zone warning. You know, we, we have way too many um, fatalities or accidents on our roads every year related to work zone, you know, um, accidents and incidents. So. So that's an exciting one for, for me to, to be able to provide an extra layer of protection, hopefully to our maintenance crews that are out there on the roads. Um, you know, some, some of the lessons learned as we build our system and to become the first fully connected city, uh, you know, that maybe some other communities um, can take away from our deployments and our projects. Uh, probably the number one thing is network readiness prepare now uh, for the future, uh, you know, make the investment in, in your network uh, now or at least as early as possible. So that's gonna be your step one. Um, fiber uh, is, is obviously, uh, for me, um, it's greater than, than wireless. So the, a fiber backhaul is very crucial and it provides an extremely reliable connection between your infrastructure back to your tra traffic man management system. You also have some additional benefits with the fiber. You, you can handle much more equipment at your intersections. You've got your traffic management system, your PTZ cameras, detection systems, as well as the smart infrastructure that, that you may want to deploy in the future. 
Uh, again, wireless communications are great, but they, we found that they can't handle the volume of data that's, that's coming back to our servers. Uh, our intersections all have pretty much the same equipment, and, and that makes it much easier to troubleshoot and swap things out if needed. Um, being flexible would be the second takeaway that we've, we've come across. You know, um, technology, this technology has come a long, long way in the past few years, and, and there's still a lot of ground to cover. And, and it makes it hard to, to put your finger on one specific technology because it is constantly evolving. Um, I don't, I, I feel like technology doesn't change, but it does evolve. Um, probably the most glaring example of that is the FCC ruling uh, that's uh, sunsetting the DSRC technology that's out there in, in favor of, of LTE. And so we have to evolve towards moving away from the DSRC. Uh, so that's something that we didn't necessarily anticipate three or four years ago, but it's it's something that's in the present, and, and we have to respond to that. Uh, personnel, our support of our administration has been really amazing um, from the beginning, and, and that really stems from our collaborative culture that we have here in Marysville and within the Beta District. And uh, so that's very crucial of having administration that understands the significance of, of the, the goals that we're all moving towards. Um, having personnel that are responsive and, and capable to maintain the infrastructure and the, the uh, system uh, are, are very important as well. I have a staff of one here, but we are able to be pretty responsive to, you know, situations that may come up. Uh, for example, we, we had one of our partners called us and, and asked us, uh, you know, they're having some trouble with uh, a piece of equipment, and we were able to coordinate that with them and, and get the the equipment switched out for them, you know, within an hour, and, and they were they were very appreciative of that. Uh, so so being responsive to to those needs is is pretty crucial as well. Uh, just some additional information here. Uh, we there's a YouTube video showing uh, Honda's smart intersection, and and that's a really good. It's about a five or six minute video, and I would really encourage anyone uh, to go to that and, and watch that. It's very very interesting as well as the there's a news clip here uh, showing some of the advancements that we have. So and I'll just close with um, one of my favorite quotes from Mahatma Gandhi, the future depends on what you do today. And, and so what we're doing today is setting up a, a pretty significant and I hope a, a safer and more efficient uh, world for, for our, our kids and, and our families. So um, I just thank you again to the APWA and for LTAP for putting on this webinar, uh, my contact information is there. And so with that, I will pass it on to Thea Walsh. Uh, and uh, there you go, Thea. Hi, everybody. Uh, thank you, Mark. And uh, making sure you see me on the screen. There we go. Uh, anyway, I am Thea Walsh Ewing with the Mid-Ohio Regional Planning Commission, and um, this is not my presentation. I apologize. Do not note. Hang tight. Do you know how that one came up? There it is. <laughs> All right. Uh, thank you, Central Ohio APWA, uh, for having me. I am uh, going to be speaking with you about Central Ohio's smart mobility innovations. Um, I want to give you an update on Linkus and uh, on Hyperloop. Um, so what we've been doing in Central Ohio uh, is a partnership for the strategic growth um, and a mobility investment for the future. Uh, and this is um, known as Link Us here. It's a combination of partnership between the city of Columbus, CODA, the Mid-Ohio Regional Planning Commission, and Franklin County, and so many other jurisdictions and private sector um, representatives in the region. We also have a strong citizen base too. Um, so the goal here really is to open up those mobility corridors and the smart piece of this comes whenever 
have transit components. We actually need some of the bus rapid transit. The lines you see on your screen are actually the lines that are proposed uh, for the Linka system. And um, I want to share with you a little bit more about our planning. So for Link Us, um, we're not just about the transit, the premium transit that we want to attract to the region, but we're also, these corridors, we're looking at them for things beyond that. Uh, because I feel like smart is technology plus human centric. And so we're really looking at those human centric pieces, such as affordable housing, opportunities to be able to access green space nearby. Um, so this is a, a top to bottom approach, uh, including trails and on on um, the uh, roadway bike lanes and things like that. It isn't just about the transit, but this transit is definitely that technology piece. So as we're planning um, this bus rapid transit system for Central Ohio, there's a couple of things that basically make it that smart piece, uh, level and multi-door boarding, off-board fare collection. So the idea that whenever someone gets on, they don't have to actually go through the reader anymore. And CODA has already updated their entire system to be much better with the fair media and actually being able to have that wallet on your phone now. Um, dedicated right away um, is the more the real estate piece, but then I feel like the smart transportation component that's really important will be signal priority and intersection control uh, for these transit vehicles. So that's gonna take quite a bit um, of beyond uh, this capital improvements I've already brought up. This is where a lot of that investment for smart investment is. And then moving into those modern vehicle designs and also having modern amenities like Wi-Fi on board and um, even at the driver's assistance, things like mobile eye that help um, identify when someone's getting ready to step off of a curb, maybe before the driver can even do so. Uh, then frequent and and uh, regular service on vehicles that are high, higher capacity on these major corridors, having stations where people feel safe um, and have those additional amenities there so that it's getting in and out of the bus is easy, easy accessibility for people in a wheelchair or any mode. And the fact that the bus doesn't have to like kneel or anything when they get on and off board will be key is that will save some time. Um, and then just the adaptability. I mean, these vehicles do not have to look uh, like a normal bus. Uh, they can have the look and feel of light rail, but they are still their wheel rolling stock as opposed to a actual rail um, designed vehicle. And it's significantly less cost, which means we'd be able to uh, do more of them as we roll that process out. Um, this is going to be really important for Central Ohio as we're, we know through our Insight 2050 um, planning, we're planning to grow uh, to 3 million people by the year 2050. Um, and so from that point, we did that study, CODA doing its next gen study, us looking at all these quarters, we're finally at the pinnacle peak of making decisions based on all of those, of those items. And SMART is very much a part of that conversation. So some capital improvements um, we're going to be looking at with CODA and the city and Franklin County, um, just looking at mobility hubs. Um, I'm sure there's going to be some significant tech elements as part of this. Uh, I know that I've been in conversations about electric vehicle charging at these facilities, electric vehicle charging for CODA's fleet, things like pantographs and in uh, in road charging um, areas for the buses will be a part of the conversation. Um, I know I've already written a grant for one. So, um, you know, more to come on the types of vehicles. We're moving more over to that electric uh, side of things, but they also have, um, they also already have um, natural gas vehicles. So they're really very much moving to that green side. They're not completely out of diesel, but they're getting there. All right, so vending and markets, uh, spaces, micro markets, you know, these are these are items, although not super smart, very 
um, human centric and being able to, um, you know, get get your items out and anymore, you know, being able to use a credit card at those or your phone to access those. I think there's still a very much a smart component. If you think about the fact that at a hub, maybe Kroger's could come and drop off your groceries, you pick those up and then at the park and ride, you just throw those in the car and go on home. Boy, that's quite the convenience that we don't currently have. As I mentioned, you know, having these electrification um, around along the corridor. Uh, and then Coda has moved into these smaller vehicles known as Coda Plus um, for connecting services uh, that are much more modern. Uh, there's also facilities for those. And then our, our bus um, shelters and how we're going to approach the public we're gonna, is going to be different too. So I think a smart is important. Uh, important component, but I feel like this is also can be termed a modern, much more modern system. Um, so where are we at on this process? Um, we actually started with the Northwest Quarter um, uh, study first, but actually East and West Broad are entering their design phase and are actually going into um, the funding process. So it's actually West Broad and East Main, I apologize. There's also a um, East Broad component. We're kind of setting that one aside right now. Um, it could be very well be um, another opportunity down the road. It's just not gonna be one of the first ones, but East Main, West Broad. Um, and we have actually already filed uh, and they say we, as in CODA, has filed um, their small starts um, request with the FTA. So um, moving towards that 30% design and being able to go through that small starts program. Um, so I feel like it's a really good place for us to get off the ground, um, especially when we know there's a lot of funding coming um, down the pike. So, and these are very much existing programs that we'll be able to leverage those. Um, so I couldn't be more excited for the partnership we have around this and really the momentum we have on the ground um, and it's taking, you know, the people and the technology. So, uh, you know, I, I talk quite a bit on Hyperloop when I'm in, in in a crowd like this and people ask me about it. So, so I just wanted to throw a couple slides in here just uh, to give us a brief update on where we're at with Hyperloop planning. If you're not familiar, back in 2017, um, Central Ohio did win a, um, win the uh, Global Hyperloop Challenge is one of the top 10 potential routes in the world um, to deploy this technology and it moves at around 700 miles per hour, which means we can move from Chicago to Columbus in 30 minutes and from Columbus to Pittsburgh in less than 30 minutes. And we're still continuing that process. We've been doing studies with them ever since that process, watching the technology evolve. Um, this is one of the very first, uh, the XP1 um, vehicle and what it looked like. They have, they've now evolved to something that's more a top, uh, a top tracked um, type of uh, uh, unit and tube, but basically the, uh, it's a cargo unit kind of maybe larger than, just larger than a minivan or a regular size van, but maybe not as large as a city bus. Um, and um, they use a low pressure system on electric propulsion um, and the, it's magnetic levitation, kind of like maglev, but within this vacuum environment. And then uh, the autonomous control platform, which is basically like, if you think about Uber, look where you can just call up your vehicle. Um, and the system itself works a little bit like the interstate with on and on, ramp, on and off ramps. This That's just like a go over in case you don't know what Hyperloop is, I would assume you are. You do know that. So uh, I'm going to end here with the fact that we are continuing to work with Hyperloop. They are heavily vested in a certification site in West Virginia right now. We're keeping tabs on that development and as they take off the ground there. The big piece for now is that regulatory framework with the federal government. Uh, we do get involved um, with, you know, talking to folks in Washington about the technology, our desire to be involved with it. So it's really at that place right now. 
Um, you know, we talked to them about considering pilot opportunities. There are a couple new items uh, that came out in the um, infrastructure bill that actually allows for Hyperloop to be funded. And then we just continue to facilitate that co collaboration. So you hear me talk about passenger rail right now too. Um, just know that Hyperloop is not off the table for Central Ohio. Uh, and with that, I am ready to move on to the next presentation. And that is going to be Rich Granger with Drive Ohio. You are up, sir. Wonderful. Thank you, Thea. And I'll share my thanks with uh, Central Ohio APWA and LTAP for hosting us today. And uh, I thought I'd round out our comments today with, with sort of a statewide perspective. We've been zooming out here. We started in Marysville, we moved to Central Ohio. Now we're gonna talk about uh, picking up on the themes that our first two presenters shared and then adding uh, sort of a statewide perspective. Uh, just, just for fun, I'm, I'm gonna bring up a, a video to get us started. And uh, my, my introductory comment on this is that this was shot uh, at Springfield Airport last week and I'll let the video speak for itself and then I can explain what the heck you're seeing after I show it. no hands. That was the AXA aircraft from Lyft at Springfield Airport last week as part of our Ohio Advanced Air Mobility Showcase event. It was a, an exciting day uh, for o Ohio aerospace history and uh, I'll, I'll explain as we get going here what what the Fly Ohio initiative is all about and, and what was happening there at Springfield and why it's happening in Springfield and how that has become a national, if not international, hub of activity for advanced air mobility. So uh, I'm Rich Granger with Drive Ohio. We're an initiative of the Ohio Department of Transportation. Uh, that's the state center for smart mobility. When we say smart mobility, we're talking about automated, connected, and electric vehicles and infrastructure on the ground and in the air. So I'm gonna give some, just some quick updates about all of those topics, uh, plus workforce too, which is a, a part, a big important part of our portfolio. Um, so Ohio does have a very broad portfolio. We'll touch on air and ground, electric, uh, automated and connected uh, with a few updates on all of these topics. So you've heard about some of these um, technologies. We've been talking a little bit about connected. I'll get into automated vehicles. I always like to start with a little bit of technology history. Um, and this just kind of shows how we've built up to the point that we're at. Um, you know, from the early days of traffic signals all the way back to almost 100 years ago when Garrett Morgan up in Cleveland came up with the patent for the first three mode traffic signal that led to eventually electrified signals into uh, intelligent transportation systems, active traffic management. You see initiatives like the I-670 smart lane in central Ohio and plenty of other initiatives um, building up to this point of having connected and automated vehicles. So uh, just an interesting perspective on where we've been and, and where we're headed. So let's talk about connected vehicles a little bit. Uh, this will reinforce some of the things that Mark talked about and also peek ahead to the future of what's coming next. Um, so uh, earlier this uh, uh, this fall, we, we did have the ribbon cutting on the 33 corridor that Mark mentioned. It was very exciting with our partners from the Beta District. Uh, that, that all happened at uh, the Transportation Research Center at East Liberty up at the northwest edge of that corridor. So here uh, uh, is a visual of, of, of where that's at, where everything is happening. You heard a lot about what's happening in Marysville, some amazing work there with Honda and plenty of other partners. Uh, Dublin has a connected initiative, and of course, East Liberty is home of the Transportation Research Center. Um, so as you're driving along that 33 corridor, if you're a passenger, you can you can watch for those, uh, uh, those roadside units on the side of the road. If you're a driver, please stay focused on what you're doing. And so what's next for the 33 corridor? Uh, just uh, over this past week or so, we had the Omni Air Ohio Plug Fest, a great event that had a lot of different equipment coming into central Ohio, some of which is, is staying here for a few months worth of additional testing. 
some of the equipment we've already installed is dedicated short range communication technology. During this event, we, we saw a lot of uh, connected vehicle to everything, CV to X equipment being tested both at laboratories at Ohio State University Center for Aut Automotive Research, and then along the 33 corridor with, with testing in Marysville and Dublin. We're also looking at the future of 5G. So we're looking at lots of different versions of connected uh, along that corridor and, and exploring opportunities elsewhere in Ohio as well. So we're excited to, to be a host of that event and uh, you'll see some more publicity coming out of that and, and some more testing announcements coming soon. As Mark said earlier, when you think about what's my next step, what should we do as a community if we wanna get engaged? Uh, we wanna make sure that everybody has plenty of resources to think about this. Here's an example. So Drive Ohio earlier this year released what we believe to be the first system engineering guidebook for connected and automated vehicles. This is all available on our website. Uh, so just go to drive.ohio.gov uh, and you'll see uh, these resources. And what we did, what we did was uh, over a multi-year project, we started with community engagement. Some of you may have been part of those, some of those community listening sessions. We wanted to hear what are the use cases for this technology. And then we went through some of the steps of system engineering to get communities ready to deploy this. So you aren't starting completely from scratch. You can grab a template, you can adjust it for your own use case and you can put it to use. So without getting too granular, here's an example. This is pulled out of one of the documents on that website. Uh, this was from the concept of operations report. And I went all the way ahead to, I don't know, page 70 or 80 or something like that and found this particular scenario as just one example. So you can see we've got several pretty in-depth reports and studies and, and guidebooks available on our website. We'd encourage you to check those out, try them out, ask us questions. Um, and, and you can see here this particular scenario, you had a multi-vehicle crash. How would you respond? Who are the stakeholders? What are some of the potential use cases? Again, this is just a snapshot of some of the tools that we pulled together and would encourage you to, to, to check out those resources. Shifting from connected to automated vehicles, I'm, I'm gonna talk about two different grant programs that are ongoing. And then I can also mention some, some of the latest updates on automated shuttles uh, happening in some of our city uh, partners across Ohio. Uh, so first I'm gonna spotlight the Rural Automated Driving Systems grant in Southeast Ohio. Uh, this is one of two different US Department of Transportation grants that we were uh, fortunate to win. Uh, this was in partnership with the Tr Transportation Research Center, TRC, several university partners, including uh, Ohio University, University of Cincinnati and Ohio State. Uh, and, and several other industry and, and, and technology partners coming together to test automated vehicle technology in rural environments. It's important because we wanna look at how the, how the environment affects these technologies and make sure they're developing in a way that they can be used in all sorts of different settings. We'll have truck automation at level two of SAE automation. We'll have level three passenger vehicles that can move cargo or people. Uh, and of course, we'll be collecting all sorts of data. Uh, those vehicle deployments will be coming soon. Uh, so stay tuned to our website for more updates on that. We have another exciting project, a separate federal grant. Uh, this is uh, the I-70 Truck Automation Corridor, a great partnership with uh, Indiana Department of Transportation. And again, the TRC is, is an important part of this program. We're looking at deploying automated trucks along I-70 and other corridors in Ohio and Indiana, uh, primarily connecting Columbus, Dayton, and Indianapolis, but exploring opportunities for other routes as well. The Turnpike is a partner on this as well. We'll be looking at level two and level four automated trucks with deployments expected to start late next year uh, with outreach ongoing with uh, technology vendors, but also with fleets operating in these two states to make sure this technology is integrated into daily operations. And the TRC will be supporting us with infrastructure audits to look at the condition of uh, the current conditions uh, of pavement, striping, lighting, signage, all these different pieces of infrastructure and how an automated vehicle sees and senses that environment to understand are any adjustments needed as this technology starts to fully deploy and then we'll pr produce those results for others to use uh, as a guide for the future. Um, shifting to the air for a bit, and I did mention we also have automated shuttles um, on the ground, uh, so we can always give updates on those as well. Advanced Air Mobility, uh, Fly Ohio, what is this all about? Uh, this is about the future of air mobility. As I said uh, just last week at Springfield Airport, we had all sorts of OEMs gathering for this exciting event. Uh, we're talking about the future of air mobility, electrified, uh, moving cargo and eventually people. This is the lift 
aircraft uh, that you saw, and the, the Kitty Hawk uh, heavy side is shown just behind it there. And there were uh, easily five to seven different OEMs at that event, representatives from FAA, NASA, and the Air Force. This is an eye chart. This is just to illustrate there are all sorts of different terms and technologies. And just know that this is a whole growing industry. And it's just incredibly exciting that Ohio is right in the middle of all of this. So why Ohio? Why Springfield? How did this come, come to pass? Well, you've got the Air Force with their Agility Prime initiative making a major investment in air certification for these platforms so they can be developed, tested, and built here in the United States. Uh, so it's a national security imperative. Uh, well, uh, through that Agility Prime program, <clears throat> uh, ODOT and, and, and the state of Ohio had already partnered with the Air Force Research Lab on the Sky Vision system deployed at Springfield Airport for low altitude air traffic control of these platforms. This is a, a test from Drone Express, which later teamed up with Kroger to announce Kroger's uh, first drone deliveries in Centerville, Ohio, not far uh, from Springfield where this was first tested. Uh, we've also been deploying uh, radar systems uh, in central Ohio. This is the view from the top of ODOT headquarters looking at downtown Columbus. We're using those radar for unmanned traffic management research projects. And then NASA is a big piece of the puzzle here too. They have an advanced air mobility national campaign. Ohio was fortunate to be selected as one of the participants in a collaborative activity. Uh, some work we'll be doing, we'll be supporting and feeding into that NASA Advanced Air Mobility Campaign. Uh, the Ohio work will start in Springfield, as, as I was discussing all the uh, activities there, but then we'll be connecting Dayton with Columbus, and then we'll be connecting Cincinnati, Columbus, Cleveland, and then pulling in Athens and eventually moving into Northwest Ohio. So as you can see along the bottom there, this is a growing initiative uh, that, that's accelerating quickly. Um, as validation of the excitement and, and, and opportunity, uh, th this new uh, hub will be installed at Springfield uh, Beckley Airport over the next two years. Groundbreaking starts in the spring. And some of that equipment is already in place, but the big building is, is, is uh, coming soon and it'll just further accelerate all the activity in Springfield. I'm just gonna close out with a discussion of electric vehicle uh, updates and then a little bit on workforce just to round out our conversation uh, this morning. So Ohio is looking at a comprehensive electric vehicle strategy. We're looking at policy and planning, economic and workforce development, looking at how this will affect funding in the future uh, for things like transportation funding and infrastructure planning. Some of the signature things that we've done at Drive Ohio in partnership with many others, uh, we've released a few different studies. They're, again, these are all available on our website. We put out an electric vehicle charging study last year that looked at where the existing infrastructure is at and where we could fill in some gaps with both level two uh, charging and DC fast charging. Uh, building on that, uh, earlier this year, we released a freight electrification study looking at fleets with a lot of input from different stakeholders and looking at things like uh, truck parking and all sorts of considerations as fleets, maybe some of the earliest to electrify, especially for last mile delivery in those smaller, uh, smaller types of vehicle classes. Uh, again, on our website, we've got different resources where you can track and and observe things like uh, alternative fuel vehicle registrations. And then we're in working in close collaboration with partners like the Ohio EPA. They recently released a new call for funding. Uh, last year, they put out a call for level two charging that was in co uh, correlation with our study that I mentioned earlier. Now they've put out a new call for DC fast charging. This is on the street now, you can, you can check it out. Um, and uh, responses are due by January 31st of next year. Uh, and we're excited to continue that strong partnership with Ohio EPA. Uh, just to close things out, I'll highlight some things we're doing with the future workforce to make sure that we've got a ready workforce for all these technologies as, as the jobs continue to evolve in this exciting space. At the high school level, we're recruiting smart mobility ambassadors. We're working with Dublin City Schools, Metro High School, uh, the Columbus City Schools, Green County Career Center, and, and more on the horizon, including Marysville, uh, to, to get some high school students trained up on smart mobility career opportunities, but then they also perform outreach with younger K through eight students as a chance to earn uh, volunteer hours towards graduation. Uh, we're also work, working with the Ohio STEM Learning Network on their annual K-12 design challenge. This year's theme is STEM Builds Ohio. And uh, this gives K-12 students uh, an opportunity to reimagine how they might improve the infrastructure in their own community. This could be on their school campus, in their neighborhood, uh, so we'll be including some Fly Ohio and Drive Ohio content uh, as part of that program. We're very excited for that. 
And uh, we also recently held a statewide Vertiport Innovation Challenge for the infrastructure to support all these advanced air mobility uh, platforms that we've been talking about. You can see uh, over six different colleges and universities, over 50 students, 30 different organizations with some great industry sponsors shown here. Um, and the, the, the teams of students all knocked it out of the park. It turns out the, the team from Sinclair College was declared the winner. Uh, they, they were all had wonderful ideas and were actively working with many of those teams to implement their ideas here in Ohio. So I wanna thank you for your, your time today. I think we're gonna open it up for questions and uh, my contact information is here. Feel free to reach out and visit us at drive.ohio.gov. And with that, we are open for questions. Thank you. Great, thank you, Rich. Uh, first question that we have up here um, is for you, Rich. Uh, we hear that rural broadband is a significant focus of the president's transportation bill signed into law just two days ago. How can these funds benefit transportation for those most in need? Sure, great question. So I'll start with a, a, a comment about a, a statewide initiative that some of you may be familiar with. It's called Broadband Ohio. Uh, it's, a, it's another statewide office that's looking at that very subject of broadband, even before the federal funding. Uh, that office was stood up, uh, I think, over a year ago. And it turns out the two the two leaders of that uh, office used to work at Drive Ohio. Peter Vodeberg and Patrick Smith are both over there. So it, it's not a coincidence, in my opinion, that there's a lot of correlation between broadband access and connectivity and all the technologies we've been talking about. So uh, we're staying in close uh, coordination with that team. I know they just recently published a, a a fantastic workforce initiative also in coordination with the governor's office of workforce transformation looking at the the workforce to support all of that we're going to be following that example with electrification looking at the ev workforce and, and what type of skills are needed to install and maintain all of this equipment whether it's charging stations the vehicles themselves um, and the manufacturing and supply chain of all of that so we definitely see a connection between broadband and smart mobility um, and, and while we haven't yet announced a, a tightly collaborative program in that area, I can see that coming in the future, uh, especially in rural areas, but also uh, just as important in urban settings. I know that the Broadband Ohio team had a great announcement. I think it was in East Cleveland a few months ago. Uh, so the, the digital divide is real. It's significant. It's a huge issue, especially when it comes to equity. And I, I couldn't think of, of, of a more inf important infrastructure initiative to focus on right now. So I'm glad to see all that funding. Uh, moving in that direction. Thea, here's one for you. Uh, everybody has a different understanding of smart mobility and how it will impact their daily lives. In your opinion, what is the definition of smart mobility and where do you see it providing the largest impact in the next five years? Thanks, Josh. Yeah, so I um, think it starts with the person right um and that person's ability to be able to access the system i mean certainly uh at the forefront of this we have a lot of testing going on in ohio and that's very different from the live environment and so being able to deploy these things and that they're actually useful um systems for citizens of the state that's when we've actually arrived at smart mobility but i think what you've heard today from mark and rich is that not only are we a place where these things are gonna be taking off, but we're the place where they're being tested and where they're being vetted for the United States, if not the world in some cases. So, um, you know, what, what I was talking about for the most part was things that we're hoping to deploy, which seem uh, pretty small compared to, you know, flying drones and the testing going out on, out on 33, but they're, re they're real human centric improvements. In the next five years, could we get one of the BRT routes off the ground? You know, I, I think it's more of a decade. Uh, it, it's, a, it's within this decade is what we're looking at. But, you know, are we gonna start to see changes, uh, the construction needed to set up those dedicated lanes for the BRT systems? And, you know, making those small investments that basically build to this, you're all engineers, you know that these projects have to be phased and brought in over time and the planning that, we do at MORPC is right now, like our long range plan is 30 years out. That's necessary in order to be able to get to the end where we actually see Rich's flying drones taking off and autonomous and connected vehicles, including our bus system running down the roads. Thank you for your question. 
Uh, Mark, here's one for you. Connected intersections, vehicles, and roadways have a common goal of reducing congestion and fatalities while improving the safety and efficiency of our transportation system. Are you aware of any studies that demonstrate the level of success in reaching these goals? Uh, you know, I, I'm not aware of any, and maybe Rich may, may be aware of something. I, I'm not aware of any, you know, studies on the current deployments and the results of those deployments. Obviously, there's there's Ohio that's, you know, very involved in our deployments here. There's been several deployments around the country uh, as well. I, I'm not aware of any. I, I can only imagine, obviously, like you mentioned in the question, that's what the focus is, right? And, and so uh, providing an alert to a driver, um, again, it's just another layer of, of you know, connection or, or awareness to, to that driver. Uh, distracted driving is obviously a big thing, and but these are not connected uh, vehicles are not intended to provide distraction, more of uh, an alert in a certain circumstance. So, Rich, I don't know if, if you have any, any information on specific studies. Yeah, so I, I, I'd point to maybe a few different resources, and, and I would imagine that, that the, the very specific answer to a, a study would be available there, and we can also do some research after to, to get a, a, a more nuanced answer. But what I would say is the Transportation Research Board has a whole variety of different national studies. There's the NCHRP initiative, and don't ask me to spell what that stands for, but I mean, there's just there's a, a wealth of information. There's an annual conference. There's working groups, and so within those areas, you'll find a, a, a lot of depth of, of information about what's being done. And then, um, you know, I would say there are a lot of, um, a lot of stakeholders came together last week for that on the air uh, plug fest. We, in addition to the testing I described, we also had a day long policy workshop at the state house in the atrium there. So you had several different panelists, um, both regional and also national coming in talking about this. Um, highlighting some of the, the the work that's being done, the importance of capturing the effectiveness of all this. You had uh, people from a human factors perspective up there talking about that very issue of managing, you know, the uh, balancing safety with driver distraction to make sure that that all that all works out. So I think as we're seeing these deployments really take off, we're going to start seeing more of those results published. And uh, I think those are just a few of the resources that. And and I, I will just add also, there's a connected vehicle pooled fund study. That multiple states are involved with including ohio i think it's over 26 states and uh, my understanding is that that uh, pooled fund study group will all be meeting in ohio uh in december i think in dublin so um i think that that audience will be yet another example of uh, where, where the latest state of the art is at and where the results are headed uh, Mark, how does your project work with the installation of audible pedestrian signals who uh, in with individuals who are blind? So our, our projects are specifically focused on driver um, interaction, right? So uh, the, the OBUs that we're going to be deploying have a visual component of an HMI, a human machine interface. It, it does have an audible alert that comes in uh, through that HMI as well. Um, as far as a, a visually impaired pedestrian on the roadside, there's no interaction with that uh, on the roadside itself. Um, these are specifically in vehicle um, deployments and interactions. So the, the idea there is a pedestrian that um, is at an intersection with one of our thermal cameras, if they are in the intersection or outside the intersection, it will provide an alert to a driver that there is uh, a pedestrian in the roadway uh, to again provide that layer of safety uh, as well as if they're at a our, our push button activation um, pedestrian crossings are, are where we have rapid flash beacons and mid block crossings where you, a driver may not expect a pedestrian to be in the roadway so those are all accessible pedestrian signals at the intersection so the pedestrian has the an audible you know button and a tactical uh, interface there at the at the intersection, and then the the idea then is the driver receives an alert to be more aware of a of a you know a vulnerable road user that that may be there. Thanks, Mark. 
Uh, Thea, the next two questions are for you. Are the off-board collection machines designed for ease of use by persons with disabilities? Well, I think they have to meet the, uh, I, I, first I'll say, I'm not an expert on that, but I have seen off-board at least vending for that. And it's going to be similar to like it, what an ATM would have to provide such as braille uh, keypad components and the opportunity to be able to plug in and hear the hear the prompts and stuff. So I would compare it close to what you see in other style vending type machines. And uh, next one here is Hyperloop focused on accessibility for persons with disabilities. Oh yes, a hundred percent. That that would be a component of each of the vehicles that they would deploy. Um, station areas would be very similar to that level boarding um, that you would have with the BRT system or or a um, subway system, uh, and then of course uh, being able to navigate the cabin. Um, I, you know, the one thing I will say is the FTA and the FRA already have a lot of those kind of inner workings for ADA in the works. They're probably not perfect, but we do have an opportunity to influence design on um, new types of vehicles that are being developed. So now's the time to be asking these really important questions. Rich. Does the guidebook include info about accessibility slash safety for individuals with disabilities? That is an important question. I would have to go check to confirm that. I can tell you that we think about accessibility a lot here at Drive Ohio. In fact, we we just um, reluctantly let one of our interns uh, go just because she had the nerve to go graduate, but her uh, focus uh, was was very much and continues to be on accessibility because of her own personal lived experience. Jen Schlegel is just outstanding and has taught us a lot and we have a lot more to learn. So um, it's an important topic. I know we're thinking about um, also accessibility of electric vehicles, uh, especially as it relates to uh, paratransit. So we've thought about uh, potentially sponsoring a design challenge in that, in that space. So uh, to that very detailed question, I would need to go back to the resource and if, for some reason it's not there that's an ad we could fix but uh, i'm pretty confident it's it's at least been mentioned as a topic somewhere in there thanks thanks rich um the i believe this next one is for you uh, is there going to be guidance to install ev charging locations that are accessible to individuals with disabilities um we do not currently have anything like that in central ohio the state does have a more general plan for the kind of various levels that uh of engagement for instance they're a little more focused on the interstate system and then the locals have to be a little more focused on their region um but i think that's a good point um and certainly that something we should investigate as we're helping people navigate that that process so I'll take note of it, uh, but also, um, you know, do more research on it because I think they would have to be able to make sure that people could touch the screens and stuff for charging. And last one here, I'm not sure who this one's geared to, so so which uh, ever out of the three knows it, please uh, chime in. But uh, are students with disabilities being recruited for the ambassador program? So, I, yeah, since we're running the ambassador program, I can jump in. So, yeah, we are open to all students from all backgrounds, all, you know, so absolutely everybody's welcome. Uh, we're tailoring that program to whatever the partners who are participating might need. So we're, we're very thoughtful about uh, not everyone has equal access to transportation and, and um, you know, so we're, we're trying to be very flexible in how that ambassador program looks. So. We're always looking for new candidates. Um, I think I saw at least one chat pop up with a with a new candidate for me uh, in seventh grade. So hey, you know we're, we'll take anybody, and uh, you can contact us. Go to our website drive.ohio.gov/ambassador, and we have information there. And you can just email me or our, our, all of our contact information is on our website. So just reach out, and yeah, we'd be glad to glad to discuss that. And with that, that was the last uh, question there. This uh, one here isn't a question, it's more of a comment. Based on what you folks are doing, I want to move to Ohio. So I think to wrap this up, I'll say thanks to our presenters from Central Ohio APWA. I also want to make sure to give a shout out to Steve Cook over at Osborne Engineers. He helped to set up this whole 
uh, webinar here and he's also a member of the board. So thanks to everybody and that will be it for our webinar.